All right, thanks everyone for joining. I had a chance to look at some of the attendees, a lot of familiar names. So this one's a little different. This one's um, targeted toward marketing people. So uh, I just wanna, you know, one of the, being a, um, a digital agency that really focuses on um, design, strategy and development. Um, this is really for those marketing types. With that said, if uh, depending on your role within your organization, I'm sure you can have some takeaways, um, but this is uh, catered toward more of the, uh, more of the marketing type person. So let's get started, shall we? And there's a poll that popped up and I'll be, uh, I wanna encourage people to use the chat and talk through this stuff. So I'll ask some questions, um, feel free to say where you're coming from. It's always interesting to see um, since we're, uh, you know, global now and all over the world with these webinars. So my name is Trevor Calibro, like Joe said, I am the senior uh, user experience strategist here at Atten. And today I wanna to talk to you just about why you need brand driven UX strategies to begin with how to create a branded interactions uh, part of your brand book. And then I'm gonna walk you through seven steps of adding that into your brand book. But first I wanna talk, this entire presentation is based on one overarching big idea, right? And uh, this big idea is, this is, you might've seen this theme throughout some of my other uh, webinars, other talks, but the idea here is think of your website like a person, a person that personifies your organization's values and that people, users are coming to, to communicate with you. And you wanna be able to communicate in the most ideal and positive light. And you also wanna communicate with a point of view. And that's where brand comes in. So this is called conversational design. It's not new. I didn't come up with the concept. It's been around for a very long time. Um, I have a whole talk about conversational content development uh, and now I want to bleed this into branding and some more UX strategy. So I consider this conversational UX strategy uh, brand edition. And um, we've seen this pattern emerge. That one of the great things about working for an agency like Atten is we, we get to see tons of different cl clients. You know, I've been knee deep in tons of different brand books and I get to see a lot of different things. So if you're a, a agency yourself, I hope you can use these takeaways. If you are a marketing team, I hope you can start to integrate this in your own practice. Um, and I wanna just talk about, we all use the term look and feel. And I think a brand book, most people's brand book is really good on the look, but what about the feel? And that's what we're talking about today. So what does feel even mean? You know, like what, what, what would you say the feel of your website is? And more importantly, what would your users say the feel of your website is? And by proxy, that means what's the feel of your brand? So go ahead and use the chat here. I want to, I want to see what people have to say. Put in the chat what your current brand book has to say about the feel. And I'm going to define that a little bit more. So, you know, many organizations have some guidance around uh, editorial voice and tone of their content. But what about the tone that you leave your users with as they execute tasks? What about the engagement within workflows? You know, th these are all the aspects that, you know, contribute to feel. And the bottom line is, Feel is determined by your interaction design strategy. So the way users literally interact with your, with your website. So the interaction design is kind of the missing piece of the puzzle of what we see um, throughout a lot of our clients today. And, um, and oh, I see someone said, we don't even have a brand book. If you don't have a brand book today, that's fine. Um, this will actually be the starting points for developing a brand book that uses this conversational style. So, um, and with that said, if you have a brand book, these, I'm gonna give you an easy seven step process on how to augment. You may be able to skip some steps, um, but that, it's a really like a teacher person, person to fish model here. And we wanna give you like actionable tactics that you can start using today to do this. So um, that's what we're gonna be talking about today is, you know, feel is commonly misunderstood. It's understood as the way users feel as they interact with your site when people say look and feel, but really when people say look and feel, the feel is the way that you've decided to design your workflows and how each element uh, reacts to the way your users act. So what your users do and how your website reacts, how your website as a person would react in a conversation. That's what I want you to start thinking like. So here's your brand book. Of course, that's your brand book because it's blue. Uh, everyone's blue, it seems. And one thing I see time and time again, and by the way, uh, we wanted to bring this um, talk to you because this is a, an emerging trend we see as well. 
Um, many organizations are looking to update their brand books. And in doing so, they're trying to keep up with some of these large companies that are, we're gonna go over how they've integrated interaction design into their brand books, right? So we don't wanna get left behind. And this is just not a nice to have anymore. Having a, a consistent style, a consistent interaction strategy is definitely like losing you business if you don't have this. Uh, there's a lot of research around it and I'll go over a little bit of that today. But if this is your brand book, I see it like this. There's usually a large UA, UX shaped gap in the heart of your brand book, right? And that makes me so sad because, you know, I want to start off by just changing your mind frame when it comes to interaction strategy altogether and how that strategy can fit into your brand book. I want you to think of this like that big idea I talked about is some simple tactics on how to have a conversational UX style integrated into your current brand book. So what does all this mean? How does it look in the real world? I just use some examples that we know of. So Apple, thinking of Apple's website, if you've been on it in a while, and how does it seem? Are you, if, if Apple was, Apple's website was a person, how, how would you be interacting with that person? What would the conversation feel like? Well, the conversation to me feels like you're talking with a keynote speaker at some large conference, right? Every single click on apple.com, like it seems to reveal the newest life-changing innovation. Um, and that's what they're going for. That's not by accident, that's by design. Google, um, what kind of character is it that you're discussing with when you're on Google? I know for me, when I'm using Google Apps, it's a little bit like being stuck in a room with Willy Wonka, right? Uh, the conversation with Willy Wonka leaves me in a state of wonder. It's kind of whimsical. I want to engage more. Um, I don't really know what's going to happen next. You know, those kind of things. It's, it's right up their alley. And you can kind of see how using, I'm going to break this down, how they do it. But you can see by using it, um, that's part of the brand, right? In fact, it's the way your, your brand at the end of the day is the way your users describe and the, the way your users feel through that conversation on your website. And then final example, IBM. So if you've seen IBM's website, it's like very structured. Um, it's on a very nice grid, uh, got a got strict grid layout. It seems very optimized for efficiency. Um, it's kind of like talking with Spock. So as a user, I believe talking with Spock would be like, you know, give me the most accurate logic-based information as quickly as possible. And that's the vibe you get from IBM. And I believe these are my, this is the way it makes me feel. I, I bet you they wouldn't say that they're Spock, but I bet you Spock is more closely re related to their brand guidelines than say Willy Wonka. So the way I've formatted all this is in a worksheet. Now, after this, you'll be emailed the worksheet. Every time you see a screen like this with blue, this is what the, these are actual like screenshots from the PDF. And the worksheet is, it's unlike some of the other supplemental materials I've given. These are literally like, you could sit down with your team, walk through these steps and they're, acti they're literal activities. And at the end, you'll be able to have interactions into your brand book. So let's start breaking it down. Um, the first two steps, step one and two of the worksheet, I call your brand as a person. So I wanna talk to you about this conversational style and how you can frame your entire current brand around this. So step one is defining who is your brand as a person? So this is step one of the worksheet. And what we do in step one is we answer these seven questions. So what is the age of the person that you've picked to personify your website? What gender, if that's relevant? What occupation does a person have that uh, personifies your brand? What hobbies do they have? What are some other lifestyle details that seem relevant or that add context? What does this person do for fun? And how would others describe the character of the person you're using to uh, personify your brand, the, your capital B brand? And here's how I envision these steps going, how I envision this worksheet. It could be like, like uh, if you go through all seven steps, minimally, you could probably do each one in a half hour. So that means in under four hours, and this is something I, I would advocate for uh, people to do at least once a year. So if you, can, if you can at least do four hours worth of work, a little less than four hours, within a year's time, you could totally keep an updated brand book. Uh, most brand books I see are kind of rotting on the vine. And this is a very simple framework. Now, I believe it seems like a cumbersome and a really big endeavor to update your brand book, but this is a great framework to just update it in a normal sense, but also to really think about it 360 from the UX perspective as well. And what, what I advocate you do is you set up, you know, take your next Let's say you have a marketing team and you could be a team of one or a large team. But the next time you have a team meeting, you know, dedicate the first half hour to the first page, the first activity here. 
And what you would do is you do the classic diverge converge technique, which means in the first 15 minutes, everyone kind of in the room goes to in their own corners and they fill out step one, um, uh, answering these seven questions and the next step that I'm gonna talk about. And then for the next 15 minutes, you come together, you discuss as a group, and then you come to consensus and define these and then put those in your brand book. Now, this is important for two reasons. One, it starts to switch your brain into that big idea, thinking of your brand as a person. And then secondly, and more importantly, I think, is it gets everyone on your team in alignment. So there's this phenomenon in the world of uh, sociology called the false consensus effect. And what the false consensus effect is, is humans have a tendency to believe everyone else interprets certain words, phrases, and things the way they interpret them. So I see a lot of these words uh, thrown around, values thrown around in brand books, but does everyone have the same interpretation of those words? These kind of activities will ensure that as you onboard new employees, employees across the board, and I encourage cross-functional team meetings, we could really have consensus and understanding and uh, you know that kind of that apply across your entire team. And what that'll do is it'll clarify things and it'll make this point, a strong point of view, which is the key here is being dis, uh, distinct, descript, targeted and have a strong point of view, very, very, very uh, kind of understandable. The second part of step one is what we call these um, brand attribute continuums. So we have all these names for this stuff, but a continuum is just, you wanna take those circles and move them to one side or the other. Is it kind of in the middle between professional and personable? Is it all the way, is your brand as a person, is that person all the way personable and not as professional? Are they all the way professional? Now note, in continuums, there are two positives. There are no wrong or right answers for this, and each um, organization will be uh, their own. Now, I put these exact ones, these exact continuums in the worksheet. You can add more if you'd like. Just remember that they're, they're both positives. Uh, level up. Okay, so one thing we do it at in is this teach a person to fish model. Now, I'm going to go over something that's not really in the uh, workbook. So this is not minimal viable. This is something if you want to level up, if you want to take it even a step further. So we do this really great activity at that, and it's called the this but not that activity. So if you define those attributes on the continuum that we just talked about, but just like I said, the false consensus effect, can we define those even further? This activity does that. What it does is it's this exercise. This could be part of your meeting too. This takes, it could take up to 10, 15 minutes. Um, and you, you wanna think of your each individual attribute on a representation like this color spectrum. And on the one far, we have this. So in the example we just used, it could be professional. Um, and then what you wanna do is you wanna find the that. Now you don't want your that to be all the way to the end. Now, the idea here is that unlike the continuums, these are opposites, these are negative. So you're taking this and what, what, what goes too far is that. So let's give some examples here. So uh, a good, you know, something that might be like this would be um, smart or dumb. Like dumb would be all the way to the far end. And that's not, that's not very helpful. But what if we said smart, but not pretentious? That's what that is. And all that does is it gives us all a common understanding of what that means. How far, how far is too far when we're thinking about being um, smart as a brand attribute, as a personality attribute? So how does this look in the real world? You would import your uh, brand, uh, your organization's name here. So my organization is, let's go back to this, focus in on professional. So what I did was I kind of moved the balls um, and because professionals indexed all the way over, we'll use that one, for example. So uh, my org is professional, but not stuffy might be a good example. So see how that's a negative compared to the continuums that were two positives. All right, so that's step one how to define who your brand is. Step two is picking specific personality traits. So we're gonna be back to the worksheet here. Um, this is what step two looks like within the worksheet. And it's similar to the last stage. We're gonna ask ourselves these kind of questions. If my brand's a person, how does that person look? How does that person sound? How does that person act? And how would you describe that person's overall essence? And back to the worksheet here, I encourage you again to do this as a team. So imagine the first, so week one, you do step one in a half hour. Week two, week meeting, the first half hour you can dedicate to step two. You diverge 15 minutes. 
I, I give a bunch of example traits here in the gray. So maybe you take some of those, you can all be Googling. Silently, everyone in the room builds up what they think goes under our brand looks like these personality traits. Our brand sounds like these personality traits. And then again, you come together, that's the uh, converge part of the diverge converge methodology and you come to consensus. And again, document it. So how does this look in the real world? Well, I'm gonna use an example of Lululemon. Many of you are probably familiar with this and Jenna's gonna put the Lululemon. Um, oh, and she already, I see she put the, uh, we have a article on our blog, our, a blog article about the this but not that exercise. So feel free to click that link and read more about it. It, it breaks it down step by step. This is the Lululemon example. Um, they're famous for having a customer persona um, called Ocean. So they, they broke down all of their customers into a single, well, they actually have two, but let's, let's just say Ocean is their one. There's a male and a female. Um, Ocean is the female and she is by far the primary. So pretty much they boiled all of their research down into one target uh, customer called Ocean. And this is not the same as a brand persona, but I wanted to use this as an example because I'm sure many of you have seen something like this. And Lululemon is the best example because they haven't fragmented their, their target customers into multiple different personas. They only use this one. So this is kind of, in fact, it's exactly what you would want to do with your brand. So you can see here, um, and then we put a link in the uh, description here to see the full case study. Um, it goes through all the research, the problem statements and the recommendations. But this is that background piece. Um, and you can see here, the key to a good persona, just like this one, is being um, very specific. So if you look in some of the details there under the second star, it says um, she's engaging, she, she has her own condo. So I can guarantee you that if you were to look at the real demographics of Lululemon customers, most of the, it's not like a majority of them own their own condo. That specific detail is based on research. That means, what do I mean by research? Interviews, um, surveys, Google Analytics, and of users. So you do that internally with stakeholders and with users, and you can build this single power persona for your character of your website. And we have something similar like this at Atten. This is our UX persona um, template. Now, again, this is not the same activity. This is for identifying a sub-segment sub -segment of users. Um, here's what it looks like all filled out. But I wanted to show this because we can expedite these things. If you already have something like this, feel free to use this as a starting point to then lay on top your own brand persona. There's no reason why you couldn't just go through the same activity of, of filling out these um, bullet points, but doing it in the vein of the research that you've done around your own brand internally and externally. All right, so that was the first step by prior, uh, uh, persona, you know, that's the documentation part that I just talked about, that Lululemon example, by making a persona document. That's how you document all those personality traits and all of that, um, the uh, continuum and things like that, that we talked about. Now that's how to build a brand as a person. Now the second um, kind of phase of this is step three, four, and five within the worksheet. And this is how to identify and prioritize user tasks. So the first step here is creating a top task list. So what does that mean? Here's what the um, worksheet looks like. And I'm gonna walk you through these steps. It's just very straightforward. So first, what we're gonna do is we're gonna define critical tasks. And we're gonna do that by answering these following questions like, are there any use, uh, tasks on your website that users absolutely need to fulfill a organizational promise? You know, for example, if you're a, a web, uh, your website sells birdseed, you're a birdseed seller, um, the ability to purchase birdseed is a critical task. Um, another way to define critical tasks are any information um, like that users absolutely need to then do a, a critical task. So, um, you know, any kind of information. If if uh, buying birdseed requires you to prove bird ownership, I don't know anything about birds. <laughs> I don't know why I use that example. But um, it, th then that information, that's a critical task, finding that information, because you are literally stopped as a user if you don't understand you need to do that. And then the last question to ask yourself when identifying critical tasks is, is there anything that can happen during the, the uh, critical task that could prevent me from fulfilling that promise? Meaning, you know, if you have to type in a field, your uh, proof of bird ownership ID number, I, I have no idea, <laughs> but say you have to do that, that's a critical error. If you cannot do that, that should also be listed because it prevents the user from doing the, one of the critical tasks, which in this case is buying birdseed. 
So once you do that, you write those out. This is another activity, diverge, have everyone write out what they think, um, look at Google Analytics, bring, bring some of that um, uh, information to the table, come back. And next step is add the common tasks. So you can see my critical tasks one through five are now bolded. And what I mean by bold is they're, they're set in stone. You cannot ever get rid of a critical task once it's identified, unless there's a major change within the, uh, the company. So the trick for identifying common tasks is to think of it like the pre, uh, Pareto principle, right? Like the 80-20 rule. So think of, take every single thing you can think of that people do on your website and put it into one of four categories. Almost every user does this thing. Most users do this thing. Less than half the users do this thing or only um, a few users do this thing. And then one and two, almost every and most users, that is your, that, that those are your most common tasks. Um, does that mean that we dismiss the, the ones that are more tertiary, the less than half or the only a few? No, but there's a lot of research out there that suggests, uh, same thing, by the way, it's the same research, the same vein of research that tells us it's really important to, um, it's really important to be specific with our personas because the more specific we are with our communication, the more specific we are with identifying um, top tasks, there's a radial effect. If you can accommodate a specific case, it's very likely that other people, although you know other personas may not be that exact person, they will relate to that kind of person, right? A, a lot of questions I get about this stuff is like, is you know, is Ocean like, is that for my organization that seems aspirational? When I go through th these activities, am I thinking about what I want my brand to be, or am I thinking about what my brand currently is? And the answer to that is. It's up to however you define this um, project. If you're trying to kind of get a benchmark and understanding and just update your brand book, then do an audit, um, do a, what, we, what exists today. If what you're trying to do is a new rebrand project, update the brand book altogether because you're rebranding, then I suggest you do the ocean thing, the aspirational thing. So once we have our 80-20 rule, we can get our common tasks on this list. The last step is deleting similar tasks. And by similar tasks, I mean things that have similar workflows. So you can see here, I, I gave an example of, I crossed out common task two because it might have the same um, or very similar workflow as critical task four. And because critical task four is a critical task, it should never be removed from the list. Now, what, what does this mean? So a, a critical task might be um, purchase the bird seed. A common task might be look at all the specifications of the different bird seeds I can purchase. So if the only difference between those two tasks are at the end of identify the differences, you click buy, then you get two birds with one stone, ha ha, bird seed joke, um, two birds with one stone, and you can just uh, dedupe and get rid of common task two. Now let's say you find that three tasks are very common. That's fine. The more we can consolidate, the better. So in this case, I showed that um, common task four and common task five are similar workflows as common task three. So we might as well just do one instead of all three. And then last example here is um, common task seven. Let's say common task seven is this similar to, to common task nine. I just wanted to demonstrate the reason why seven is crossed out and not nine is you wanna determine which one is the most common and which one is the most representative or the most complex. So out of this, let's just say that common task nine was a little more complex. So we, put, we picked that one because it gives us a better 360 view of our website. And then that leaves us with the final list. So you see critical task one through five, common task one, three, six, eight, nine. And a rule of thumb here is you wanna keep your final list down in between um, 10 and 15 top tasks. So let's do this in the real world. Let's see what this looks like. Okay, so I picked bonjovi.com as a, as a case study here, no reason. I, I just randomly picked this website, honestly. Um, I am Bon Jovi agnostic. I have no feelings otherwise. It's not exactly my cup of tea, but you know, no, no slight on Bon Jovi. Um, so how would this play out? How would this play out in the real world? So what are some things we, you would do on Bon Jovi's website? So here's the final kind of top task list uh, you, might, you might have, like buy concert tickets, buy a t-shirt, join the fan club, um, sign up for the newsletter, read latest Bon Jovi news. So those are bolded because they're set in stone. Those are your um, uh, critical tasks. Now here's some common ones. Look for a job opening. Yes, you can in fact work for Bon Jovi. 
um, you can find the shipping information for merchandise. Now, why is that not a critical task? Because the critical task is buying the merchandise. Yet, I, let's, I, I made the assumption that over 80% of the people might want to know a little bit about how shipping works. Um, visit Bon Jovi's social media pages. That is not the intent of bonjovi.com, but it is something people might want to do. Um, contact Bon Jovi's representation. You too can have Bon Jovi play at your birthday if you shell up the big bucks. Um, I looked into it in doing this presentation. And then finally, find Bon Jovi's, yeah, all this making fun of Bon Jovi. He's got this great charity kitchen. Now, why is that not a critical task? It is a great charity. This is where people get confused because that learning about that charity, that's a critical task for the charity's website, but not for the band's website. All right, what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna show you how to use these in the real world. So I'm going to, um, we're going to walk through um, one of these um, top tasks on bonjovi.com. So that is the next step, which would be the find the key interactions. And we're gonna do that. Here's what the uh, worksheet looks like for finding these key interactions. And what we're gonna do is we're going to do the walkthrough of the top tasks right on bonjovi.com. I'm gonna do it together live here. Then we're gonna list out every interaction that occurs with the user during the walkthrough of the test. Uh, task, I mean. And then we're going to label each one of those um, discrete uh, interaction points with either required, expected, or delightful. And I'll explain what that means. So let's take a look. Here's our top task list that we came up with. And let's just focus on reading um, the latest Bon Jovi news. So here we are, bonjovi.com. There's the animation that comes in. And um, I'm looking at this. Here's the primary navigation bar. There's news. That's where I'd expect it to go. Click news. Here's the news page. So that's one, by the way, that would be one discrete uh, interaction. So that's the interaction point that the user took. And you can simulate this. You don't need to literally watch a user do it. Simulate this, and then that's how you can um, define it. And the, oh, as I roll over these cards, it looks like, wow, okay, there's this interaction here that happens. So there's one, hover. Um, and then it looks like I have to click to read the article. So let's just click this first article. And it looks like it's opened a modal dialogue for, for news articles. And I'm scrolling. So that's click to open. That's another one. Um, scroll, that's another interaction that the user is forced to do here um, to use the system to read. And then finally, to exit, you must click the X. And that completes the entire journey of figuring out latest news. You would just rinse and repeat for if you want to read other articles. All right, so that's that. Let's go back and take a look. So how would that look? It would look like this. These are all those steps. Click the prime nav, um, hover over the card, click the card, scroll, and close modal. So now let's go through this. We want to label it required, expected, or delightful. Required means something that the system requires you to do that the user did not expect would have to happen or doesn't really care to happen. Expected means something that's common within um, the workflow that users do all the time, so they would expect to do it. And delightful are those little things that are, it, you know, if required is the stuff that you don't want to do, delightful is the stuff that entices you to do, that you do, you are glad that happened. Um, so yeah, I would say I do little circles and E's, you can do that, or you can write it all out. Um, that's expected. So primary navigation is a common place to find links to go to other you know, content on a website. So that's totally expected. Users expect to do that. Um, hovering over, I mark this as delightful because that's not a normal interaction. We didn't necessarily expect to have this animation uh, unearth more um, information. Now, from a usability standpoint, I would argue the implementation was not very good. From a branded personality standpoint, I don't know if that quick, whoosh, I mean, it was a little jarring for me. Does that match the Bon Jovi brand? I don't know. Um, but I can guarantee you, after going through these activities, you will be able to define your interactions in a, in a more um, thoughtful way than bonjovi.com creator did. Then I'd say clicking the card, that's expected. You know, click something to read it. Scrolling, totally expected interaction. And then it was not expected to open in a modal. So I say required because no user expects or really wants to click a close button to stop reading an article. Um, that is just something the system requires. So those are, are some examples of how I would categorize these. Now we've already stepped into the first phase of prioritization here, right? So I want you to, when you do this, and especially if we're doing this on a condensed timeline, like the four hours thing I talked about, if you wanna do this whole thing cradle to grave four hours, 
this is minimal viable, I say, focus on the delightful things first, then the expected things, and maybe even disregard the required things. Because what we're gonna do now is, we're gonna identify these touch points, and we're gonna see how and if we can put in some of that brand personality at those touch points through interactions. So this is some level one prioritization. Now let's get into the nitty gritty, step five of prioritization. These are um, prioritization matrix. So I'm sure you've seen these. These are really big in the UX world. They're really big in the business world. So what I did here was I took, so we, we've already lim eliminated one, right? There was one, there were five um, actions in that one uh, task, that one top task. Now we eliminated one because it was re required to close the dialogue. So now we're left with four. And the reason why we want to do this, this first level, second level of prioritization is because you know, I want to give, I want, I don't want you to be overwhelmed. Most people I believe are just overwhelmed by these kind of activities. So if we can break these up into digestible chunks, and I'll show you how to do this later, is it's really going to help empower you and give you the confidence to actually do these things. Like I really want people to do these things in the real world. Um, I, I think it would be a really a big benefit to most organizations. So how do you actually do this? How do you do this properly? Well, you see on one of the axes, we have user impact, and then we have a uh, technical effort. We would have anyone that's in charge or has some insight within your organization on user impact to give that a score um, on whatever scale you want. One to six is a great kind of scaling system. So low would be this um, modifying or writing a, an inter interaction rule about this particular um, touch point has very low impact on the user. High would be very high impact, positive impact. Um, and then technical effort would be uh, how you would want the people who are in charge of implementing this, you know, developers, to give a score. If we're doing one to six, then on the one to six scale again, how difficult is this to do? So if it's high on technical effort, that means it'll take a lot of technical effort, then um, we're less likely to uh, highly prioritize that than if it's easy to implement. So let's go, this is like, you know, we're out of the realm of the art and we're into the realm of the practicality here. So let's move that one. Like, changing, why do I put it here, right? Changing the global navigation is gonna be really high on uh, user impact because every single user will encounter on every single page. But it's also very high on technical effort. If you're gonna change the interaction um, design around your entire prime nav, it's not just the news link, it's all links. Um, hover over the cards for the details. Now I put that it's, it doesn't have as much user impact because it only applies to where there's car, the card UI component. And I put it kind of far on low because th that functionality already exists. So how much would the developer have to really tweak that code to add personality into that interaction? It doesn't seem like very much. So um, you know, in this case, my theoretical devs gave that a fairly um, low score, maybe a, a one and a half or a two. Um, clicking card, you get the idea here, right? So this one is, you know, low, not it, because it exists already, it's easy to code, but how much impact is there really on changing that interaction? Probably not as much. And then scrolling, I highly advocate to not mess with the scroll. The browser and the OS can define the scrolling. I, I just think it's a really inappropriate place to put your brand personalities within your scroll because something I'm gonna talk about a little later is, these things open the door for kind of messing with, if you're thinking only brand and only in a marketing mind frame, you could kind of mess with the accessibility and usability of your site. So I wanted to say that's extremely high on technical effort and very, very low on user impact. Um, and then I just wanted to say, I, I gave this example that you can also say maybe use uh, impact on your brand and business risk. You can change the vertices here. You, you can have whatever two things you wanna to do to help prioritize whatever matters to your organization and whatever helps you make a prioritized list, essentially a backlog of those interaction points. Cause that's what we've done. We've identified our personality, we've identified interaction points and now we're prioritizing those interaction points. All right, and that leads us to formalizing our strategy. So this is step six of seven steps. So um, in this, it's just kind of a matrix. And, and this is kind of the coup de grace moment, right? This is where you got your, your brand personality traits that we've defined. You've got your key interaction points that we just defined. And now, you know, one on one makes three. This is how we come up with our interaction strategy. And it's just done simply in a grid here. So when I look at this grid, what I'm seeing is 
all kinds of stuff. I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing, okay, so the way to populate this grid, and I'm actually, I'm actually gonna take a pause here because I believe we've skipped some slides. Something happened in my slide deck. So give me a moment. We are on a roll too. Okay. I apologize. Let's go back to presenter view. <clears throat> so this is that coup de grace moment. This is where all the rubber hits the road. So um, we look at this. We, we have that those four things that we prioritize. Remember, we left out the one that's considered required. And now we're going to try to find these. Now, I would encourage you to leave out the scroll article, the, the, the scroll thing, because that one goes under the no category. So now we've just prioritized these. This is number one, number two, number three, and we can eliminate scroll. So we've gone from five interaction points to focus on now to three. So we're getting a more focused effort here. And you just convert those right to the top level of your interaction points table. So there's one, two, three in order of priority. And how do we populate the personality traits? What we do is we look, go back to our persona documentation. If we've, if we've done it in, a, in the way that Athletico uh, did this, uh, Lululemon, we can come in here and you know, we look at some of these key words, professional, engaged, fashionable. These words were derived from the user research we did and they were done in um, step two where we identified the personality traits, right? So you go back to that step two page and you pick those ones out. And there they go, professional, highly um, engaged and fashionable. And what you do is you go through each cell one at a time. You say, when looking at the action, the interaction point of um, hovering over cards for details and thinking about the brand attribute of professionalism, is there an opportunity there for us to portray that brand attribute? And you just go through this one at a time for um, hovering over cards, highly engaged, hovering over cards, um, fashionable. So you can kind of see how this works. So let's say we've identified a branded interaction rule opportunity. This is where we'll write out that documentation. This is that key point. So in this case, we found that clicking card um, to, you know, to, uh, the, to find more information is a really great place to interject some of the professionalism that we want to portray through our um, interaction strategy. So I just want to take a huge pause here. I want to stop the uh, you know the broadcast to the cat is now out of the bag. So I, I touched on this a little bit earlier. I believe I may have just unearthed a whole bunch of strategies that can take you and your team and lead them down the road of making really bad website interaction decisions, right? So I wanna to talk to you about how branded interactions and usability slash accessibility kind of meet up at this point. Cause now we're at the, where the rubber hits the road. This, when you start to write that documentation, we really have to make sure that we're not overlooking some of these critical points that are, uh, like I said, these are no longer um, table stakes, you, or they're no longer uh, uh, nice to have. They are table stakes to, to operate um, a viable business. So I want you to use a metaphor when you're thinking about um, UX in general. And I want that metaphor to be usability and accessibility are the guide rails that are around the highway that you get to play within with design. Now. I believe that UX, the UX field in general, I know me in particular, I often get a bad rap for stifling creativity. And I think that's a misperception. The, the, all, all we're trying to do with usability and accessibility is offer those uh, mandatory uh, guardrails, right? Because what you don't wanna do is go flying off into the ocean or go flying off into, you know, like, shardy rocks. <laughs> what, what you wanna do is you wanna, and there's plenty of room to flex here. So the last thing we want to do is stifle creativity, but we want to give you a, a sense of when it's gone too far. Um, also, you get all this room too. So I, I really, I really want to push back on the sentiment that doing proper UX and accessibility stifles brand. Um, this is something I hear from marketers a lot. In fact, I believe the best way to portray your brand is to play within the confines of accessibility and usability for many reasons. But if, if I haven't convinced you, then let's just put it this way. If you want to convince the world that you care about, you know, minority type users that interact with your website and your content in unique and augmented ways, then at least think of it from that standpoint. It's a way to prove is that you're within those guide rails, that your website is accessible and it is usable. All right, rant over. 
now I can sleep with a clear conscience tonight knowing that I told you that. So um, you have to mix all this together. This is just a, a 45 minute talk. Um, we, we have a two day seminar in which we go through all of this in depth where we, we marry this conversational style with the try and true principles of UX. Um, if you'd like to know more information about that, feel free to reach out. All right, so back to it. Let's look at some real world examples of this. So um, these are some links, Jenna's gonna post them. Let's look at the first link here, which is the um, Google Material Design Library. This is the idea of a full, fully fleshed out library for um, interaction design. Now this is best in class. Uh, and I, I wanted to cue in, this is just, they're just demonstrating the interaction behavior, the interaction strategy behind checkboxes here. And you can see there's a little bit of Willy Wonka in here, right? As the cursor clicks, there's that, there's that kind of light explosion. Um, why do they do that? It, it doesn't need to be there. It's not required. It's not standard, but it, it, it's a nice little interaction point where they can interject the Willy Wonkiness of their brand. And there's many, many examples on this website. They even go as far as they have an in implementation layer here where you can go in and actually see code snippets. How do you code this thing? Um, so this is, like I said, best in class, and it goes through many, many, many different, here's all the different stuff that it talks about. So none of our clients go this far with a fully functioning website. Um, but with that said, we do this exact type of information, and I'm going to show you how. And this seven-step process could eventually lead to this if you take it in digestible chunks. Now, Google, they took a large team of thousands of people and, you know, set them loose on this project over the course of years. You don't need to do that, though, and I'll show you why. Another example, let's define these more and more um, specifically, is you've probably seen stuff like this. It's a button library. So you can hover over these and see the interactions. Button libraries are great. Um, my one caution is I do believe many people start here. This is where people start when they're thinking about how their UI elements look and what the behaviors will be. They start by Googling button libraries. This is a fine step, but this is step six of seven, right? So I really encourage you to do the first steps and then come to this kind of thing. Then look at the Google um, material design rules as guidance. Look at this for inspiration. Um, and furthermore, I believe whoever created this did not go through those, that process. And here's why I say that. Some of these things, this right here, this warning link, that does not pass accessibility standards. So right here, this is actually documenting and you know formalizing a pattern that's not good for usability. So that's why it's important to do these things in a holistic view and to look at them as a whole. Um, but you can see all different kinds of interactions. This is more like IBM, right? It's, it's very explicitly giving feedback to the user on hover that there has been a state change. You know, maybe you're more subtle like this one where it's just a subtle drop shadow. These are the decisions that can create that feel. This is where, like I said, the rubber hits the road. And how do you pick the right button? You look back at steps one through five. And let's dig even deeper. I just Googled buttons and I came up with this blog, which had a bunch of examples. So first of all, I wanna call this button out because there's a breach here. If that, if the word, if the label on that button didn't say hover me, then click me, I don't know if users would, that could just be text, that could just be a label. And then on hover, we get this rainbow effect. Now, what I like about this rainbow effect is it has a clear point of view. What I don't like is it's not adding anything to the, to the experience. In fact, it's possibly detracting. And we'll get into that a little bit later. This is what I call a tacit um, interaction, meaning the user hovered to engage the interaction, but then the animation happens not because, the, unlike the uh, checkbox, that interaction happens to indicate to the user they've clicked this is not to show any indication at all. It's just a cool effect. So I guess a good rule of thumb is uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? This is what I mean by kind of mixing in um, protocol. Here's an example. This is a perfectly fine overstate, a nice interaction. I don't know what this says about this company's personality, but it's, it's totally fine. I, I wouldn't say anything good or bad about it. It's slightly slow. That, that would be the only thing. And I'll go over best practice for UI elements is 300 milliseconds or less. 500 if it's a large, but no, never more than 500 milliseconds. There's a lot of research around this. And then here's another example I want to show you is this button. Now, I gave this presentation before, and we got some feedback that like, but that button's huge and ugly. Now, watch what happens on press, right? OK, so yes, but what I love about this example is it has a very clear point of view. This button might be perfect for a website that's 
conveying that that's personification is someone that's retro, you know, some hipstery type techie type person, you know, someone that maybe maybe it's like Mario from Mario Brothers or something like that. I, I, I believe this is great. And it, it's a marriage of that visual design that most of us already know, the look from our brand book, and then the push down, you know, that, that feel of the, of the um, engagement. Here's some more examples of what not to do. Here's some on hover, check these buttons out. They just do like things that, they don't give you any more information. The user has to sit and wait. You can imagine how annoying it would be to have every button in like a global navigation do this every time you hover. So if you expect users to come to your website repeatedly, I advocate not to do these kind of things. Um, these are perfectly fine buttons. These types are fine. And then I wanted to call these out. These are more examples of the tacit animation. These are extremely bad. And um, when I was talking to our accessibility guru here at Atten, um, Michaela Blackham, she, she turned me on to this that I have it written down here just so I don't forget that the, the accessibility rule for this is that um, on any particular web page, there should be no content that flashes for uh, more than three times within the period of one second. Um, this is like seizure stuff. So this is like do no harm stuff. So it's it's not it's it's even past like basic usability and accessibility. Like you could cause a seizure if you do stuff like this. So I wanted to show examples. And by the way, this is what gets misinterpreted when I give this presentation. It's like oh cool. So let's that's that was the big like caveat. I mean you need to cross reference these with accessibility and uh, usability guidelines. I mean, look at this thing. This could literally, like, it's it's bad for your brand. I don't care what the brand personality is. And then, I mean, you, you they go on and on with the different kind of interactions, right? Does this add value or is this just, I can do it in code, therefore we should. And then lastly, just check this out. Just don't, all right? Knock it off. Don't do that. Okay. And then the last thing I want to call out from this list is the bottom um, this is a tool. So this is a tool that shows you um, what you can do with easing. Now easing is the animation style that you put onto your um, onto your uh, uh, animate your interactions. And this is a really great way to inject um, personality. So like I said, duration, it defaults to um, 500. I want to encourage everyone to always default to 300 or less. Linear, you can click it, make it move, and it shows you what will happen. It's a pretty neat interface. Here's all different ease out. You know, are you the ease out or the ease in? Now, there's some basic ease out, ease in rules. I'm not going to get into those today, but you could come in here and kind of see how stuff moves and you can tweak your own. And it gives you the code right here, which is, it's a great tool. There's many tools like this. I just wanted to call this one out. All right. So that's kind of some examples of documentation. And of course, we do this at Atten ourselves. So here's some examples from our real clients. Notice this is a button library. It's much more thorough than the button library that you saw earlier. Um, we have all the states, including the active and focus state. Now, what I want to call out here is um, this, you probably have something like this in a sophisticated brand book, right? This already usually exists. But did you consider when you made these buttons, besides just the color and the font, is this an opportunity to express our brand um, personality? You may have, but let's take it a step further. We also do things like this behavioral guidance written out. So when I said documentation, what does that mean in that grid? It's stuff like this. This is just written out how the behaviors of a primary navigation um, should work for this client. And that was to, like I said, these are all based in research and it's based off of the first five steps. And then of course we have code snippets. So this is a code snippet of the way a uh, kind of the easing and the way a component would, would work. And we even go as far as this kind of thing where we'll come in and um, you know, we'll actually build the thing. So this just shows you some easing on the, uh, see how it's quick and snappy. That's in general, no matter what your personality is, you want your animations to be quick and snappy. So in some cases we'll do this um, or even something. So you can see it's all the components of the uh, Google uh, library just broken up. And then lastly, to round out the, the talk here, I wanna talk about timeline and KPIs. So how do we make this really happen? This is straight from the uh, the grid that's within the planning grid that's within the handout. So we list out our objectives. Goal one, it could be something like these are the long term objectives. Something like document all animations, like we just talked about using that easing um, that easing tool. Document all animations from the top task list. Okay, that would be a good one. Now next, we want to estimate the date 
in which our team can produce some impactful results. So what does that mean? Sometimes I like to start all the way on the end. We have six stages here because this seventh stage is, remember I said it's seven steps, but it could be done in six weeks. So this could be the six week if you do one step a week. Um, <clears throat> so the estimation here is sometimes you wanna start at six and say to that, that uh, overarching goal, that long-term goal, how long do we estimate it'll take over this entire six weeks? And then go back and refine down to the to, uh, individual date. But you eventually want those dates to be set in stone. And then the next step, this is the great Peter Drucker's quote, you can't manage what you can't measure. So the next step is to then pair those things with a KPI, the milestone with a KPI. So a good KPI might be uh, you want to increase user uh, survey scores. So a user survey score would be you benchmark what they do today on a survey. So you write out those brand attributes you, and you can ask a question like, um, after using the website, uh, how, how, uh, how much do you agree with this statement? Um, this website portrayed, uh, this website gave me the sense of professionalism. And you do one of those, what they call Likert scale, not so much, a little bit neutral, a lot of bit, extremely professional, that kind of thing. And then over time you can track. And why is this important? You and I as website and content creators and as marketing people, we know, we know the value of this, but this is a way to evangelize this project across your organization. And it's a way to prove and to keep yourself accountable. So the project managers in my life love this kind of activity. And that's all I have for you today. You can rinse and repeat that all the way through all the tasks. So I hope that was helpful. Um, I really encourage you to go grab the, uh, grab the, we're gonna send an email out with the, the PDF worksheet and actually go through those steps with your um, fellow employees or with some cross-functional group. Because like I said, it'll create a very good understanding and you'll be able to then take those writings that we, we just documented and put them directly. You inject those directly into your brand book and uh, that's how we do it.